Welcome to this uh, virtual session on welding and driving. Uh, glad to have you here in our welding bay in Dubai campus. I'll take you through the risk assessment, then uh, my colleague here, Matthew, will take you through uh, the demonstration. In a grinding, we will normally uh, deal with rotating uh, mechanisms. Uh, we've got a grinder here, we've got a couple of them out there. So always make sure there is no loose items, clothing, jewelry, hair, all should be taken care and tied up. Uh, sharp edges are really expected here. Most of the metal pieces which we are going to grind, cut, uh, they will have sharp edges. So never uh, handle them without wearing the correct gloves. Hot surfaces are expected in here. Every welded piece of metal or a freshly grinded one will be hot. Uh, never uh, wash them with bare hands. Always wear the correct gloves. Now, a good thing to mention here, even if you are wearing the thick welding gloves, never touch directly a piece which was just welded. Uh, these are for protecting your hands, but they are not to handle uh, hot objects. Fumes uh, and weldings will be expected. That's why we do have the exhaust fan, which you see in here, and this will be operational all the time while doing welding. Okay, that's where we wear safety shoes because falling objects are always expected on uh, workshops. So we are going to give this fuel exhaust to wherever you are going to weld and we'll make sure that this is uh, running all the time. Compressed gas is used in uh, the TIG and MIG welders. We normally inspect these for any leakage. If you notice any leakage, please do let us know. Ultraviolet radiation. Now that is the light which comes from the arc of the welding. This is very strong. Never look to it uh, bare uh, eyes. We will be wearing the welding helmets. Uh, Matthew, can you show us one of these? Yeah. yeah. So these will be automatically activated whenever uh, an arc is there. For any reason, if they don't fade in, uh, do let us know. Always make sure people behind you uh, are wearing their masks and you notify them before you start welding. Uh, last but not least here, uh, which probably will not apply to our virtual session, but uh, welding machines normally use high current flowing into conductors and that generates very high electromagnetic field, which in some cases might affect medical uh, equipment like pacemakers, uh, and so on. So if you are going to conduct real welding, please consult uh, your doctor and inform uh, your supervisor before conducting any of that. If you do have any questions related to the health and safety aspects of welding, please uh, drop me a message and we'll be happy to deal with that. Uh, I'll hand you over now to my colleague Matthew on the other side. If you turn around, Matthew, or to you. Okay, um, so today what we will do is uh, prepare some samples. So you should end up uh, with some square samples like this, which will then be welded together. Uh, in order to create the samples, first of all, what we will do is use this machine to cut off the sample. Then we'll use uh, the grinder to grind off any sharp edges and to prepare the metal. And then we will use uh, the MIG welder to weld them together. So this uh, is what we use to cut the metal. It's commonly referred to as a cutting disc or a, a cut-off saw. Um, it actually technically is a, 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 a grinding wheel because this is an abrasive. So rather than cutting through the metal, it's grinding through it. Uh, this is what the disc looks like. It's just an abrasive material that grinds through the metal uh, and then chops through it. Uh, as such. Uh, before you use the uh, equipment, you should always inspect it uh, to make sure it's safe. Make sure the guard is in place, inspect the grinding disc itself, and make sure it's not been used to cut anything that it shouldn't be used for. So for this machine, we only cut the steel with it. Um, some examples, uh, this for example, has been used to cut aluminium. Um, this is something you shouldn't do because as you can see here the aluminium gets stuck in the pores of the grinding disc and as you cut it through metal the aluminium heats up, 
causes the disc to crack and shatter, which will then send uh, bits of the grinding disc everywhere. So make sure the guard's in place. Set the disc, make sure it's in good condition, it's nice and tight. Another example uh, of something you shouldn't do is this as well. So this crack here has been caused when the wheel has been pulled down too fast and too hard. So when you're cutting off your metal, just, uh, get the disc spinning, bring it down nice and gradually, let the disc do the work and cut through the metal nice and smoothly. Like I say, once we've finished cutting off the sample, then we'll go over to the grinding wheel and we will prepare it. Now what we need to do is make sure all of my exposed skin is covered up uh, with some flame-proof clothing because uh, this will generate a lot of sparks and a lot of heat. So I'll put these on to protect my arms. So Matthew, sometimes uh, like whenever you start the grinding will sort of give you like a reaction or feedback and the motor is turning really fast. Um, what are like the key elements? Do you want to keep the wheel touching before you start it? Do you keep it away? Uh, what's the best way around that? Yeah, so as you say, it's a very high power motor. So when you first pull the trigger, there will be a bit of a kick, a bit of a force backwards. It's always best to keep it some distance away from the material that you're cutting. Pull the trigger, let the disc get up to speed, and then just gradually pull it down. You don't want to start it when it's touching the material because then the motor is trying to, to get through the material before it's up to speed. So pull the trigger, get it up to speed, and then gradually pull it down. Um, yeah. yeah. So we also we need to protect our eyes. Um, so a minimum you would require would be safety glasses such as these. Uh, but ideally what you want is a full face mask. Uh, because if anything happens, anything comes off, the disc shatters for example, they want to make sure your full face is protected. Okay, so I'll get my face protected. Now, uh, it's a good time to mention that some of these uh, welding helmets will be also good for grinding. Uh, it really depends on what you are doing. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, probably a grind, yeah. So, you just need to refer to your risk assessment, make sure you are having the access to the right protective equipment before you start anything. So this will also create a lot of noise, so if for example you are working in here for 30 minutes, one hour, and you're cutting metal constantly, you will want to make sure you have some ear protection as well. Because we're only going to be cutting one piece, then uh, it's not too important just for one piece, but if you're spending a long time, you would want to protect your ears also. the sharp edges so you can see all these edges and certainly uh, it is hot. Uh, before we move forward Matthew I do have a quick question. I feel it's sometimes a bit tricky to find the correct pressure at least from previous demonstration. Sometimes you see um, uh, somebody who's trying to push like really slow and it's barely grinding taking like forever and then other times you will hear like the motor is really under load and somebody on just to get it cut in a second. There should be somewhere in between. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just kind of getting the feel for it, really. Um, you don't want it too slow, you don't want it to be too fast. 
I always say it's always safer to go slow rather than fast. So if you're unsure, always go slower. Um, but once you get more familiar with it, you'll uh, you'll kind of get a feel for how much pressure you need to put put on. And different shapes of material will cut in different ways. So as long as you're not using it, what you would think would be excessive force to push it down, then you should be okay. Yeah, I think another tip on that, probably from my experience, I would say, is really listen to the motor. The motors are designed normally to run at their RP, uh, rated RPM, rated speed. Whenever they start to slow down, um, you will hear, uh, let's say, the noise coming from the motor uh, coming out. What you don't want to happen is the wheel to stuck under that pressure and to stop. Now, because what will happen, as you release, the motor will try to rotate again, and you can imagine if there was a very tiny chip on that wheel uh, due to that pressure, that might initiate a crack and a shutter. And Matt, you have some uh, scary photos there, probably don't see it now, but we don't want to see any of that happen, so always ask if you are not sure. Okay, so on to the next step um, would be to use the uh, grinding wheel. Um, so we have here uh, a grindstone and we have a belt, a sanding belt also. Uh, the belt is used for, for basically um, removing any excess material that you don't want from metal. Again, like with the, uh, the cutting wheel, uh, we only want to use steel uh, on these two machines. Because uh, a similar thing will happen where if you used aluminium or plastic, it will get stuck in the pores of the wheel and that's something we don't want to happen. So again, similar process, inspect, make sure the guards are in place. When you first start it up, you should always maybe stand back a little bit, make sure that the, the grinding wheel is balanced because you don't know who's used it before you, you don't know who's put the grindstone on there. If it was unbalanced and it started wobbling, then the vibration would get worse and eventually it may shatter. Um, so always check that when you first come to use the machine. Make sure these guards are properly positioned, inspect the, the wheel. Um, we need to wear gloves, but we don't want uh, loose fitting gloves because we don't want anything to get caught in here. If something gets caught in there, then it will drag our hand in with it. So make sure your gloves are nice and uh, tightly fitting. Uh, make sure your sleeves are out of the way. Obviously no jewellery, no loose hair, ties, anything like that. Uh, and once you're happy with all of that, then, then you can get started. So as you see, when I, when I grind this, I'm going to hold it kind of, I guess I would say maybe a 45 degree angle, and I'm going to go from one side of the grindstone across to the other. Um, we don't want to hold it in one position on the grindstone, otherwise it will cause a valley or a dip in the stone, uh, which isn't really good practice. So we want to start on one side and go nice and smoothly across to the other side. Also, you don't want to hold the, the piece of material uh, at this kind of angle because the stone will catch it and try and flick it out of your hands. So hold it as far as you away as you can from the grindstone while still making sure you've got a nice tight grip around 45 degrees and then go from one side to the other. side that look like this to a side that looks like this so nicely smoothed off edges. Uh, another way of uh, removing material is to use a sanding disc like this so depending on what you're trying to do you might want to use this one or this one. This one uh, is more kind of for a finishing touch rather than this one is to remove lots of material in one go. So I'll show you this one now. Now inside there's nice uh, shiny uh, bright silver metal 
Um, so when you weld, that's what you want really. You can see the outside is kind of a grey colour, and that grey colour is called mill scale, which is a coating that forms on the outside of the metal when it comes from the, the metal factory where it's produced. Um, so ideally when you're welding you want to remove that, um, especially if you are TIG welding. With MIG welding or stick welding, if it's something that's not structural, uh, say you're making a table for example, then you wouldn't be too worried about removing this, but ideally you want to remove all of this uh, grey surface before you weld, and possibly uh, even give it a wipe with some, uh, some degreasant to remove any grease or impurities that might be on the surface of the metal. Uh, so now that's the grinding part done. Yeah, probably it's a couple of notes in here. Now, uh, we are using grinding today uh, uh, for preparing our material for welding, and this is something you do um, in general as well. But it's important to note that with the grinding and the different uh, types of grinding machines available, you might also use it as a sort of precise manufacturing where you will need to work out with surfaces and then uh, or uh, work with fits for example if you want a tight fit for a specific component you probably want to remove a little bit out of there um, and uh, so on so yeah probably welding is our next stop okay so next for welding the first thing we want to do is uh, remove these gloves because these aren't suitable for welding and form some proper welding gloves which are usually made from a, a leather type material these arm protectors and this apron are also made from, from leather, so they're also protected from the heat and any sparks. In general, with the long term welding, probably also you will have to use some uh, sort of fire retardant coveralls uh, and uh, a bit a more uh, specific uh, protective equipment to the task you have. Now, if you just compare the gloves I have here to the ones uh, Matthew got, they are both sort of welding gloves, but certainly the one there uh, gives more flexibility to handle the gun, the, the component. These are a bit difficult, and these will be ideal for stick welding, uh, where, where if you want to do a bit more precise, like the one which we see today, you want a bit more flexible ones, so you can control the gun uh, better and so on. So always refer to uh, the risk assessment and to the specific task you are dealing with. This is a demonstration and this is in no way is going to be, uh, let's say, a reference guide for you to be a certified welder. Uh, it's worth also noting welding is in general a, a hand skill, a manual skill. You will need to practice and practice again to get perfect, but the basics are always where you start from. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll start by explaining the, uh, the different types of welder that we have uh, at the university. So we have the, the four most common types of welder, I suppose you could say. Um, starting from this side, uh, this is what's usually referred to as a gas welder or an oxyacetylene welder. So it uses two tanks, oxygen and acetylene, hence the oxyacetylene name. Uh, these mix together and then you light the gas at the end of the torch and it creates a hot flame. You then adjust the mixture of the gases to increase the temperature of the flame and once you've got it to the temperature that you want, you can then use it to weld with. Um, so with a gas welder you need to use two hands, one hand with the uh, filler wire and one hand with the torch itself. So you would uh, you would heat up the metal that you wanted to weld until it starts to melt, at which point then you would start to push the molten metal along at the same time as adding the filler wire. If you didn't add the filler wire then you would uh, quite often get a hole starting to appear, so you need to replace the molten metal with the filler wire. Um, so this has advantages and disadvantages. It doesn't require any electricity supply, so if you were welding in a, in a remote location it would be good for that. Um, you can also use it for cutting metal, so if you turn the flame up really hot, you can cut straight through metal with it, which is good. You can also use it for heating things up, if you have like stuck bolts or you want to expand some metal to push a bearing in, for example, then you can use uh, these for, for that, which is, which is quite useful. But obviously, having uh, 
a big flame and a gas bottle at high pressure with uh, explosive gases in isn't really ideal in, in some situations as well. So we tend to stick to uh, these other types of welders which are called arc welders. So these three red ones are all arc welders. They're called arc welders because they use an electric arc to melt the metal. Whereas this one uses a flame to melt the metal, these use electricity. So they all have these uh, earth scraps to uh, create, uh, to complete an electric circuit. And they all have uh, an electrode of some sort. So the electrode inside here, you can see it just sticking out there. This you would hold near to the metal, so the metal is melted. And then again, you would need to use your left hand to add the filler wire. This welder is called a TIG welder, so we use these um, for really for kind of more precision type welding. If you're doing aluminium or something that you want it to look really neat, you would use a TIG welder. They offer uh, a lot more control of the current that's going through the material, so you can get a much more accurate, much more, much more neat weld using a TIG welder. Um, so anything kind of uh, related to race cars or anything like that often use these TIG welders. Uh, it's called a uh, TIG welder because the TIG stands for tungsten inert gas. Tungst the tungsten part relates to the electrode here. That's made from tungsten. The inert gas uh, relates to this, which is a gas called argon. Uh, it's not a flammable gas, but it is under high pressure inside that tank, so you need to be a bit cautious of that. This is, a, this is a tungsten electrode, so this slides inside here. You put a sharp point on the end like a pencil, and that's, that's your uh, electrode. That's where the electricity flows down through the end. Um, so yeah, this is the gas argon. Uh, it's 100% argon. And what this does is it shields the metal. So when the metal starts to melt, you need to protect that metal from oxygen in the air. Uh, and because the argon is heavier than the oxygen, as you press the trigger, gas flows out, out of here and it pushes all the oxygen out of the way, uh, which seals the melted metal. If you didn't have the gas, the metal would have lots of little holes in it and you would easily be able to just snap it in half. So it's really important that you have the gas and the right type of gas. And then there are various different settings that you can change, whether you can change from AC to DC, depending on whether you're welding uh, steel or aluminium, and you can change the current, the amperage uh, coming through it. Uh, lots of different settings depending on the type of material, the thickness of the material, etc. Now probably one of the settings uh, which is going to be linked to all our welding machines, the basic ones, is current. Uh, you can see that with the stick welder, you don't have really much of control other than the current, but then the current is present with all. Uh, the current is going to be linked directly to the uh, thickness uh, of the material you are welding and that the specific uh, piece you are or work you are doing. So it's really important uh, to know what to select rather than uh, just going trial and error, uh, especially if you are going to uh, look for a joint which will be tested further and need to uh, have certain specifications. Okay, so the, the next type of welder uh, is kind of the opposite end of the scale to the TIG welder, uh, which is uh, usually called a stick welder. It's called a stick welder because it uses sticks like this. So in this case, the stick is uh, both the filler wire and the electrode. So whereas with the TIG welder and the gas welder, we have to add the filler wire with our left hand at the same time as heating up the metal, with this one, the electricity flows down the filler wire. So it flows down this and this melts. So as you're going along and you're welding, then this is getting shorter and shorter and shorter as it melts along. You can see that this doesn't have a gas bottle. So that what this does to shield the weld is it has this ceramic coating, this kind of green coating. So as the metal melts, this green coating is what is used to shield the, the metal that melts also and shields the metal from the oxygen. Uh, so you quite often see these on construction sites because uh, they're really easy to use and once you finish you just throw the stick away, grab another one and clip it in. Uh, so it's nice and simple, doesn't require any gas or anything like that and relatively easy to use but not very nice to look at, not very precise. 
And the, the final one, which is probably the most common uh, type of welder used, at least if you're welding uh, steel, uh, is the MIG welder. Um, so again, this uses gas. In this case, it's a mixture of uh, argon and CO2. Uh, depending on the thickness of the material or the type of the material that you're, that you're welding, you may want to change the combination of oxygen and argon in the bottle. Um, the, the, the oxygen kind of cools down the weld. The CO2? Uh, yeah, so the CO2 yeah. kind of cools down the weld. Um, so if you're, if you're welding thin material, then you'd maybe want uh, more CO2 and less argon. There's various different mixes that you can buy depending on what you want to weld. Uh, the gauges, one gauge will show you how full the bottle is, how much pressure is in there. And the other gauge is the flow rate. So you set the flow rate, uh, usually uh, we set it to around about 10 litres per minute uh, for MIG welding. Uh, with the MIG welder, uh, as with the stick welder, the, uh, the electrode is also the filler wire. So as you can see from this, if I turn it on, pull the trigger. So as you pull the trigger, the filler wire is coming out automatically and the electricity is also flowing down this filler wire so it melts and feeds it in for you. So the big advantage of this is, is that you can use your left hand to hold that piece of material that you're working on or to support your body um, and you only need one hand to, uh, to actually do the welding or if you do the welders you need two hands to, to work. So it's easier in that sense. Uh, the different power settings uh, again, depending usually on the thickness of the material, you can change the thickness of the, uh, the filler wire as well. For thicker material, you would want a thicker wire, thinner material, a thinner wire. And then you can change things like uh, the speed the wire comes out, so you can have it really slow, or you can have it really fast. Uh, it really kind of depends on the, the thickness of the material that you're welding. There's lots of different um, many different settings and many different combinations of gas, of power, of uh, wire speed, of wire thickness. So really the uh, experience in welding comes from knowing what settings to have depending on the, what material that you're welding. You could, if somebody set up a welder for you then you could learn to stick two pieces of metal together within a relatively short amount of time. But then if you have a different uh, thickness of material or you have a different weld joint then the experience comes in to know which gases to use, which uh, power settings to use, etc. Um, so yeah, I think that's all the different types of welding explained. Uh, so we can go over and uh, have a try at welding. Yeah, so we have a car. So I think we have a better view. So as mentioned earlier, the arc is really going to be powerful, so you don't want to look to that well directly. Uh, here I'm going to use uh, probably a manual uh, guard uh, to protect you. Uh, however, looking through a camera or looking through a screen, you will get only the maximum brightness that screen can do, rather than the real thing. So I mean, even if, for example, if you have seen videos of welding and then you say, oh, I can see it on the video then it's just fine, that is not relevant to the real thing. So always make sure you have the right uh, protection. So the first thing we need to do is attach the earth cable. So this is a proper welding table so it has an aluminium uh, point to connect our earth cable to the because the rest of the table is steel, the electricity will flow down through the filler wire into the material that we're welding through the table and then back around to the machine in a complete circuit. Then we need to make sure that the gas is turned on, make sure there's enough pressure in the bottle, make sure the flow rate is set to where we want it. Then we check the, the wire feed speed and the power rating, depending on the material that we're welding. So all those look, look like it should be good enough. Tap weld. 
So a tap weld basically secures the metal uh, together. So we would do one in this corner and one in this corner, and then that's going to keep that plant with the other metal. If we didn't do the tap weld, then what would happen is, as we're welding down here, then as the heat of the metal expands, uh, the metal would start to spread apart like that. That's an exaggeration, but it would start to split open at the end. So we wanted to keep it nice and tight together. So the first thing that we would do would be to place a tap weld in either corner, and that would keep it nice and steady. So I'll do that now. Okay, so that's the two tap rolls done, one here and one here. So now this is nice and tight there, it's not going to move at all. Then once you're happy with your tap welds, then you can go uh, from one side to the other. So the common mistakes that people make when, when they weld is that they stand too far away from it and they'll stand behind the gun. Uh, so then you can't really see what you're doing. The distance uh, of your um, of the gun to the metal is very important. You want to keep maybe around five millimeters, half a centimeter uh, between the material and your uh, filler rod here. Uh, and you want to maintain that distance throughout. You don't want to get too close because if you get too close, it will stick to it. You don't want to be too far away, otherwise it will start making sparks and splattering, and you won't get proper weld. So maintaining the proper distance is very important. Following the actual line as well. Uh, as you can see on some of these previous welds, uh, they're kind of a bit wavy. Uh, so you need to be able to make sure you can see the actual uh, gap in the, the weld that you want to fill. Uh, so we're trying to fill this gap here, so we need to be able to see that. So in order to do that, you need to position your body correctly. So if you stand to the side and look from the side, then I can see the line, I can see exactly what's going on. I don't want to be stuck here, so I use my left hand to brace myself and to support the gun, and then I just slowly bring it across from one side to the other. With uh, MIG welding, you can either push the weld or you can pull the weld. So depending on, on what you're doing, if for example I was welding this line here, I might, I might want to pull it towards me like that. Uh, you can go either way. Uh, for this, it will be easiest to go right to left so I can see where I'm going. If I went left to right, then I wouldn't be able to see the line as clearly. So in this instance, I'm going to pull it towards me down along the line. So I'll show you that now. Also, the angle of the gun is, is important as well. You, you need to. The, the, the filler wire is going to come out of here, so you want that pointing right into the gap ideally. You can have a bit of an angle, but you don't want to be too, too far down like this. You want to be somewhere close to 90 degrees, so that the uh, filler material is going directly into the gap that you're trying to weld. Okay, so uh, when you're ready to weld, you need to make sure you have all your protective gear on. Uh, this is an exhaust fan, which we can bring over. Uh, you don't want it too close to the material because it can suck the gases away, uh, the protective gases from the argon. Uh, so just above your head would be uh, an ideal location. Uh, make sure you have your mask on and then turn on the extractor.
Well, yeah, that is a, a really good one, and you can probably see it in uh, comparison to others. Now, very important, this is now extremely hot, that's why we'll need to, to hold it away. And uh, you need to make sure that you uh, don't touch it directly. Uh, and if you access a room or a place which has welding process in, don't assume that everything has cooled down. Always uh, be uh, cautious about that. Um, looking to the other side of the metal, um, you can see now this is uh, still clean there and probably if you want a strong joint you will come back and uh, weld it. If you are dealing with very thick material then you'll normally have a groove as uh, let's say uh, this shape and then you will be filling weld as you go up and then to complete uh, all that. And with welding you can go really to uh, very thick materials and it's common uh, in the field for uh, pipes, uh, steel structure, uh, and others. Now, uh, probably Matthew have already covered that, uh, the key uh, uh, aspect, but maybe we we'll just need to go uh, quickly and let's say the main key is you can uh, keep it in mind when you want to hold the gun and how you want uh, to start the wall. Uh, how important is to see what happens rather than just uh, randomly assume that things going on. What are, let's say, your experience uh, tell, uh, tell us, what are the key things to keep in mind? Uh, so the key things really are to make sure uh, that you're comfortable and you can see what you're doing. So um, a lot of people when you first start, they're, they're scared to get near the well because of the heat and the sparks and the noise. Um, but really, as long as you've got your protective gear on, then there's not really much risk to you. So you can lean on the table, make sure you're comfortable, you can, so you can see exactly what's going on. Maybe do a trial run without pressing the trigger, just to make sure you can follow the line nice and neatly. Um, yeah, make sure you can see well, make sure you've got a good uh, brace of the gun. I sometimes hold it kind of like, uh, almost like a, you know, playing snooker or pool, and you can support the gun with your left hand and then pull the trigger with your right hand. So yeah, probably that also links to uh, what we said now. We started all this saying that the arc is going to be really powerful, eye protection is a must. But then, this comes back again and say that you need to see what you are doing. So, it's really important to see what's happening, where you are pointing your gun, and you can only do that with the right protection. So here you can't do any compromise, okay, I don't have, okay, let me look uh, behind and let me do a spot well, it doesn't work like that. Um, it's important to get your gears right uh, and get prepared to the job you are doing. Uh, probably Matthew, while we are here, this is something we don't normally cover in the normal demo uh, for time restriction. Do you want to give some comments on to holding your pieces, setting angles, using some tools yeah. to put things maybe together to prepare a well? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's many different uh, ways of uh, and, and pieces of equipment for holding down your metal. So for example, on this welding table, we've got these clamps here. You can see that the clamps are made from copper because copper doesn't stick uh, with a welder. So the copper clamps, we can put the material under the clamps to keep it held down. As I said before, when you, when you weld uh, any material, the heat causes the metal to move. So you might be welding something and you're trying to make a nice accurate box and you're welding one side and then you come to the other side and it's completely moved due to the heat of the welder. Uh, other things you can use, so if you want to, to weld a, a, a right angle at 90 degrees, you can use these um, welding triangles which are good. So they that sticks to the table and to the material to keep it held there at 90 degrees. Um, yeah, there's various, lots of different uh, clamps and, and devices and, and things to use to, uh, to help you with welding. There's endless amounts of uh, equipment that you can buy. It really depends on, on what it is you're, you're trying to weld. Yeah, it goes also a great deal to preparing your uh, metal pieces. For example, you can see the cut on this side, while the cut on this. Uh, that will save you lots of time uh, while you do your job right and also will give you a, a really good uh, uh, strength. Probably this is a nice angle in here, which I can show you. So you can imagine how this can weld them together and make a joint 
uh, compared if you want to do, uh, let's say, something uh, just like that later. So starting uh, your job right is really important by getting the right material and then prepare them uh, next. Uh, most of the material you will buy might be coated. Uh, you want to tell us something about the coatings and these yeah. kind of things? Yeah, so, uh, so usually uh, metal comes with, as I was saying before, a mill scale, which is like a, a coating that comes from uh, like the furnace when the metal is produced. It's like a hard coating. So ideally you want to grind all that off so you get back to the nice shiny metal. Uh, there are other, other um, coatings that are applied to metal. Uh, for example, so, yeah. so this here is um, it's steel, just the same as this, except this has been galvanised, so it's been dipped in a chemical uh, to protect it from rust. Uh, you quite often see this, um, and you can weld this. Uh, it will weld uh, pretty much the same as regular steel, but because it's got a chemical in there. It will uh, give off a gas, um, which is which is poisonous. Uh, it's not fatal, but you don't want to inhale it. So um, you really need to know what the material is that you're welding before you weld it. Also, if if the metal's been cleaned with anything, if it's got any uh, kind of paint on it, you need to make sure that that's all all properly removed before you weld it, because the gases that they give off can uh, can give you some uh, health side effects. Okay, sounds good. Uh, pretty much covered everything uh, we want to. Um, again, this is only a start, really. Uh, if you want to get better in welding, the key is to practice and practice again. Uh, there is resources available for you there to review, and uh, we hope that um, you have enjoyed it. Uh, do let us know if there is anything we can help with. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew, for. Uh, sparing the time and also uh, getting insight in all these uh, more experience based which is really important when it comes to welding. Uh, thank you very much for watching.